next, discussing how feature stores enable operational machine learning, we have Kevin Stump, the co-founder and CTO of Tekton. Kevin co-founded Tekton, where he leads a world-class engineering team that is building a next-generation feature store for operational machine learning. Kevin, Kevin and his co-founders built deep expertise in operational machine learning platforms while at Uber, where they created the Michelangelo platform that enabled Uber to scale from zero to thousands of machine learning drive, driven applications in just a few years. Take it away, Kevin. All right, hello everyone. I am Kevin and I'm the co-founder and CTO here at Tekton. Tekton is a feature store which makes it significantly easier to solve the data challenges that typically prevent you from putting your ML model actually into production. And over the next 25 minutes or so, I'm going to shed a bit more light on what a feature store actually is, the problems it solves under the hood, um, how you can build one yourself. And towards the end, just a couple minutes or so, I'll also show you what Tekton specifically looks like. All right, with that, let's dive in. Well. Before starting Tekton, a little bit more than three years ago, I was actually a tech lead over at Uber, working on Uber's machine learning platform that we called Michelangelo. We got started right around 2015 or so, where the company was growing rapidly. We were collecting tons and tons and tons of data, and there were a lot of different use cases that could really benefit from machine learning. However, I was taking a long time to get anything into production. Data scientists were using different frameworks and they had to wait for software engineers to put stuff into production and it just took months um, and was overall a frustrating and um, really an experience that slowed everything down. And uh, so we sat down and decided to build a central system that all the software engineers and data scientists could use to all the way train a machine learning model and get it into production. And having this central platform really led to this Cambrian explosion of machine learning at Uber, where all the different teams suddenly found a lot of different cool use cases um, that um, really impacted the business in a meaningful way that they could power with machine learning and under the hood with Michelangelo. And one key thing that I want to highlight here is that when we set out to build Michelangelo, we expected that a lot of the use cases will probably be batch use cases where you maybe predict churn or something like that. But what we found over time was that more than 80% of the ML use cases were actually running in the production system where you have to make predictions within just a couple of milliseconds. And we call those types of use cases operational machine learning. So let's look at that difference between operational machine learning and the more traditional analytical machine learning in more detail. Well, analytical machine learning is really machine learning where you have a human in the loop who maybe generates some business insights, looks at a dashboard, looks at reports, maybe once a day or once a week, your offline system creates churn predictions or sales forecasts. And um, those ML systems are typically driven by just a data warehouse or a data lake. So everything is batch centric. And if the system goes down, it's not ideal, but it's not the end of the world either. And if you compare this to operational machine learning, which runs directly in the heart of your production systems, your operational systems, what you'll find is that you have these ML applications that have very, very mission critical SLAs. They cannot go down and the decisions are completely automated. You can't have a human in the loop anymore. And we see those use cases across the board, across different industries. Very common are things like fraud detection, product recommendations, real-time pricing, um, but there's also a gigantic long tail of other operational ML applications that don't neatly fit into one of those common boxes. And another challenge um, that you see here is that, well, these operational ML systems, they consume data, not just from your batch data sources like a data warehouse or a data lake, but from streaming systems and real-time systems, which we'll see more of in a second. So let's look at one um, common example that probably many of you are familiar with, if you open up an Uber Eats app or a DoorDash app or any of the other ones out there, you'll see that the application recommends to you a list of restaurants that you're most likely to order from. And it also shows you how long you likely have to wait until the order shows up on your doorstep. 
Now, these simple things that you see in the app, they're fairly complex systems behind the scenes that make them possible. And we call this an operational machine learning pipeline that ends up with these predictions that feeds the application. And the way this pipeline works is that it ingests data from a variety of raw data sources. For instance, Uber Eats needs to know what are all the deliveries that are going on right now? Where are all the drivers? What are all the different orders that the restaurants are currently working on? And the user who's just opened up the app, well, what are all the purchases she has made over the lifetime um, of having been a customer or just in the, in the last week? And also quite importantly, well, what is the customer searching for right now, right this second? What are they punching in? And then all these raw signals, they get turned into machine learning features. And I'm sure all of you know what an ML feature is, but I'll repeat it just in case. An ML feature is basically this um, highly condensed piece of information that makes it particularly easy for an ML model to detect patterns and make predictions based on detected patterns. And um, that typically happens by cleaning up your raw data, reshaping it, aggregating it, joining it, you name it, whatever kinds of transformations you can dream of. And for this Uber Eats example, a common one would be, well, we want to know how many orders has the restaurant been working on in the last 30 minutes? Because that order count, this trailing order count, is a proxy for how busy is the restaurant right now. And the busier it is, the longer it's likely going to take until your order shows up on the doorstep. Now, of course, these ML features get fed to a model, which makes the predictions, and the predictions get fed to your mobile application. Now, very importantly, these operational ML pipelines, they have very, very tight requirements. Uptime needs to be very, very high. This thing can't go down. The latency needs to be super low. Otherwise, people are probably going to close the app. And the scale can be gigantic. Can be in the millions, maybe more of that, depending on your use case, of course. Now, the fun thing is that these operational model use cases, they have unique requirements that are very different to the analytical machine learning world, where first, the features are calculated from a variety of raw data sources, not just your batch data source, but it would oftentimes include also raw data coming from a streaming system like Kafka or Kinesis. Or you may even need to take into account real-time data that's only available right now in memory. It could be something like the user's current GPS location or IP address or something like that. Then when you have these raw signals, as shown earlier, they need to get turned into ML features and then served to two different types of feature consumers who couldn't be any more different from each other. You've got the model training on one side, which cares about knowing, hey, what do those features, what did they look like at any given point of time in the past? Because that really allows the model training system to get a sense for what did the state of the world look like in the past? So you can infer patterns from that, get a model, which can then make predictions about the future. And then, of course, the other consumer is the model is actually running a production, which doesn't care about what the features looked like yesterday. It needs to know what do the features look like right now? And it needs to know what those features look like right now with extremely high freshness. It needs to get it at very high scale, depending on the use case. And of course, at very, very low latency, meaning it, you know, if it needs the feature right now, it should have it in a couple of milliseconds and not seconds or, or minutes even. And what you see in a lot of companies, and this is what Uber looked like as well in, uh, in 2015, is that typically a training time you have a data scientist who works in a Jupyter notebook um, or some other data science environment that they like, where they get a dump of raw data, and then they reshape this data and turn it into a nice data frame with clean features, train a model, and now they've got a model that they can backtest. And once they're happy with the backtested model, they throw it over the wall to an engineer, often a data engineer or an ML engineer who now has to basically re-implement everything for production purposes, where they may now take this, you know, the Python script that reshapes data and turns into features and turns it into a Spark application or a Flink application that actually runs in production the whole time and consumes vast amount of data and turns it into features that it can now actually hand over to a model that is purpose-built for production predictions. 
And this is a really laborious and difficult process for a set of problems that I'll now dive even deeper into. And then I'll show you how a feature store solves them. First, again, as I mentioned earlier, well, you've got these features which are need to be extracted from a variety of da different data sources. Now the challenge is these data sources are often extremely different too in their characteristics. So let's focus for now on the data quantity and the data freshness. Well, your data warehouse or your data lake typically has pretty much all the data your company has ever collected, but the data isn't super fresh. Maybe it gets loaded in there every hour, every day, something like that. Or you have a transactional database like uh, your Postgres, which contains maybe the last couple of days or weeks or maybe a year of data. And the freshness is, is much better, it's much higher. Even further on the spectrum, you have streams like Kafka, and they contain, contain near real-time data, very fresh data, near real-time fresh, but they typically don't contain the whole history of it, all the data that's ever been collected in your company, but only a handful of days in most cases. And then finally, um, you can have data, which is basically prediction request data. And with that, what I mean is like in-memory data that's available at prediction time, like the customer's search query or their IP address or their GPS location. And now collecting this raw data from these different data sources is already a challenge, but not only that, also the types of transformations you can run of them are different and uh, they're not all the same. So on streaming systems, you can easily run row level transformations where maybe you combine column A and column B, you sum them up or you divide them or whatever. You can also run time window aggregations like a 30 minute uh, trailing count, but it would be very hard to run on a stream something like a lifetime sum of all the transactions or all the or a count of um, all the, the, the number of times that a customer has ordered um, Thai food on, on DoorDash since they signed up 10 years ago. Something like that you'd really calculate off of a data warehouse, which is really purpose built for these types of um, for these types of, of transformations. Now that's hard because let's imagine you actually wanna just build this naively in a production system. Well, your application would need to a prediction, talks to an ML model, which tries to make a prediction and that model needs features. Now, of course it cannot just ship a query to the data warehouse and to, to turn raw data into a feature and then make a prediction because those queries against the data warehouse, they're not gonna finish within a couple of milliseconds. They'll take minutes, hours, days, depends on how much data, of course, you, you process. Not, not a great idea to uh, just do this naively. And so, of course, what you'll end up doing is you basically put a cache in front of the data warehouse. And you ETL now data into the separate store which allows you to decouple the feature calculation from the feature consumption. Now that allows you to have a fast serving cache, which can serve data at you know super low latency and high scale. But now the data may not be as fresh anymore because it's only as fresh as the as the schedule at which you're updating the values in the store. Which brings you to the next challenge, which is how do you figure out what the optimal freshness now is of your feature? How do you make sure you're not calculating it too frequently or you're just wasting a bunch of money because these data transformations are expensive, but you're also not running it too infrequently, which impacts negatively your model performance. You gotta tune this somehow, which is complicated. And then of course, this entire mess of these data pipelines becomes really hard to manage when you're not just dealing with one data pipeline that processes one feature from a data warehouse, but now you start introducing streaming features that you need to run on Flink or on Spark, um, or you even introduce real-time features, true real-time features that you calculate on the fly as you make a prediction, like turning a customer's GPS location into a geo hash. Building this type of system out is very complicated. A lot of companies, at least in the past, implemented those on a one-off basis, but that introduces a ton of challenges. Specifically, one of the most feared ones is the train serve skew, where you calculate features in the training system one way and in a serving system another way. This commonly happens if you have two separate implementations. 
going back to our data scientist who trains a, a model and calculates features in a Jupyter notebook, they may um, do their uh, feature engineering using pandas in, with, in Python. And then at serving time, your ML engineer re-implemented those same features, say using Flink or Spark. Now it's two separate implementations and there is an almost endless number of ways in how those two can differ typically and on along edge cases that really matter. Like for instance, maybe you don't have any data for a given user. And so what should be the default feature value? Should it be null? Should it be zero? Should it be the average of the feature values for all the other users for which you have values? Not quite no. Uh, what should be the floating point precision that you should be using? Um, and there are all these tiny little ways on how the, or large ways really, if you have just a bug in there, on how these implementations can deviate from each other. And the, the, the terrible thing here is that if they deviate, you typically won't know because your model in production may just perform poorly, but it doesn't scream at you. It doesn't throw an exception that you can look at. You look at the stack overflow and you realize, oh, here's a, here's a stupid error I made. No, the model is just not going to perform well. And you've got to figure out why is that? What, where, where is the needle in the haystack here that caused this problem? And so what you really want is you just want to have one shared implementation between training and serving so that this problem cannot happen. Another very common um, type of train serving skew is ti our timing discrepancies. Let's look again at the Uber Eats example and the trailing 30 minute order count. Well, this graph here shows you the, the trailing 30 minute order count over yeah, the last 30 minutes. And it shows you the true value. And you see the lunch time spike and you see the dinner time spike. It's great. But at, at serving time, really what you'll likely get is more something like this, where you update this trailing 30 minute order count maybe every 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And so you get this step function shaped graph really, um, which shows you which feature value would be served to your model in production and how frequently would it be updated. Now at training time, you may naively say, well, I've got all the time in the world. I just write a crazy query, which calculates the most accurate trailing 30 minute order count for every single one of my labeled rows, which end up building my training data set. And so you may basically have your training feature look exactly like your true value, which is great for training purposes, but it causes now this discrepancy between training and serving where your model is used to seeing this type of a shape and this type of accuracy um, when you train it. While in production, it'll really be facing um, uh, more something that looks like this. And of course, the model is not going to perform typically just as well as it would if you had trained the model on data that looked exactly the same way at training time and at serving time. And then finally, another fun little uh, adventure in training serving skew land is data leakage, where at training time, you may be contaminating really your training data with information from the future, which you would never have access to at prediction time later on. One example is imagine you want to predict how long is it going to take to travel from San Francisco to Palo Alto. And you've got this historical set of trips uh, that all went down the 101 highway. You know the travel times. And now let's imagine there's a feature that you've added which shows whether there was an accident on the, on the highway. Now, of course, this feature would likely make your predictions much more accurate um, because an accident probably means and it's going to take longer to travel down there. But at prediction time, later on in production, when you're about to start the trip, you don't know whether a traffic will happen down the road as you're traveling all the way down to Palo Alto. And it turns out that a feature store solves these problems that I mentioned before. It connects to the raw data sources. And then it transforms the data into machine learning features. And then it serves those features both to your machine learning training system and to your ML model, which is running in production. 
And of course, it does that by guaranteeing you that it's not introducing some wild train serving skew. Um, and it makes it easy to actually put these features into production. And now a feature store itself, one thing that's super important to understand is it's, it's not a separate data processor or a, a new database or something like that. It's really, it's an abstraction layer on top of your existing data stack. It plugs into your existing storage systems and your existing compute systems where, you know, for online serving, you may use your, your data stacks Redis um, cluster or Dynamo, or for offline serving for training purposes, you may use Snowflake or S3. And the feature stores just abstracts away access to these different storage systems. And then similarly, the feature store runs the feature transformations, not in its own proprietary transformation uh, engine, but instead it plugs into the existing ones off the stack where um, at Uber, for instance, we ran a lot of queries using Spark offline or Flink online for streaming systems. Um, I see a lot of companies run batch feature transformations directly in their data warehouse using, say, SQL. And for real-time predictions um, or real-time features, you oftentimes may just execute raw Python code that turns some data blob into an ML feature. So again, a feature store really is an abstraction on top of the existing systems and really enables your compute and storage systems for machine learning. Let's go to problem two now. Well, as mentioned earlier, you may have a data scientist who works in the training system and then throws their ML features and their model over the wall to a data engineer or an ML engineer who re-implements everything for production. Of course, it's two different personas. This may take a long time. You will have to wait until uh, your downstream dependent people are actually becoming available and implement everything exactly according to your definition. A platform like a feature store automates this because it's self-serve. You implement a feature once, you add it to the feature store, and it guarantees that this feature as implemented is immediately available for production purposes. And so at Uber, anybody from any team could add any features to the system using simple SQL and other teams could just tap into those features and know that they're available the whole time in the production system to make predictions using whatever model they could, they could possibly dream up. Problem three is of course, if you do not have this automated system of a feature store, what often does that you have different um, uh, teams, different users implement and re-implement the same feature pipeline over and over again. And so you'll end up with a lot of duplication and no real standardization between, between the different teams, between the different users. Not a good idea, costs a lot of money, it wastes a lot of time, um, and it doesn't really make it easy for somebody to pick up the work from somebody else. And a feature store, as you may expect, it manages your features as central data assets, where you've got the central feature store, where you can easily discover and find features from anybody in the company, from any other team, for any other use case um, that may be relevant for your use case that you're working on. And of course, a feature store should do this in a secure way where it ensures you, where that you only get access to the features that you're supposed to have access to. All right, then last but not least problem area is that typically when a model breaks in production, it's not that the model itself actually breaks, but it's the data that breaks somewhere upstream. Oftentimes it could just be that you, um, that there is literally no data coming in anymore on Kafka or in Kinesis or no data is landing anymore on in your Snowflake table. It's a problem. Or your data may start to shift entirely suddenly or over time. Imagine that your say user's age or something like that is an important feature to make a prediction and the um, 
the your average user's age just changes over time, which has an impact on their behavior. So the average age or the standard deviation may now start to shift. And suddenly the model is making predictions on features and feature distributions in production that deviate from the distributions that the model got trained on to begin with. And so when something like this becomes apparent, you basically just need to retrain your model um, on the new data and the new data distributions. Another common issue is that you may have feature subpopulation outages. It's a mouthful, but basically what it means is imagine you have a certain feature um, or you have an e-commerce website that makes product recommendations and you sell items in Germany and in the US and you sell way more in the US than in Germany and in Germany suddenly features go stale. And you only have global monitoring going on where you look at the global feature qualities and the, the performance of your model globally. And of course, the impact of Germany is now drowned out because the US traffic is, uh, is so much higher and you may not actually recognize this problem in time. And then finally, even if you don't have these issues right away, or it, it may not be clear, like when something comes up down the road, who's responsible for it? Is it the upstream raw data um, owner? Is it the person who's implemented the feature, the data scientist? Is it the ML engineer who implemented the feature for serving purposes? Who is it? And as you can imagine, a feature platform typically helps to solve these problems too, where it monitors the quality of your features as they're served for training purposes and as they're served for production purposes, where it can help you identify that you need to retrain your model, um, or it can just help you identify that, hey, there seems to be a full-on data outage, the data is stale, nothing's going on anymore, and so that you need to look into um, the, the quality of your data to make sure that your model performs again. So let's bring it all together. These core problems, they are all solved by what we and many others by now call a feature store, which consists of the core components of monitoring engine. It helps you transform raw data into features. It abstracts away access to an offline and online storage system. It serves the features for training and for production predictions. And it provides a registry, a central catalog that you can use to discover and share and find features. And um, of course, you can build a system like this in-house on your own. Um, a lot of companies have done it. Uber has done it. DoorDash has one. Airbnb has one. Booking.com. A lot of companies have had to build these systems in-house. Or nowadays, with vendors offering them out of the box, like Tekton, of course, um, you can use them off the shelf. And the next few minutes, I'll just show you very briefly what Tekton looks like and how you could get started with it. In Tekton, we believe in what we call features as code, where you define features declaratively in Python files that you put into a Git repository. We define these little Python functions, which return basically a SQL query that transforms your raw data into an ML feature. And then you decorate it with some metadata that tells Tekton whether the feature should be served online and offline which entities they're associated with and whatnot. Afterwards, you can use a simple Tekton SDK to generate training data in your Jupyter notebook or in your laptop and fit your model with the training data. And then finally, in production, you can simply call Tekton's REST endpoint or gRPC endpoint to fetch the most recent feature values at low latency and at pretty high scale to actually make your production predictions. And this is what this looks like in the web UI, where um, what you see here is what we call a feature service, which powers an entire model. And it draws out the lineage and the entire data pipelines that Tekton is automating for you, where we are running, in this case, um, streaming pipelines that at um, production time or at prediction time continuously calculate the freshest features and put them in an online store and an offline store that then afterwards power your model that's running in production and of course your model training systems that's running offline. And then of course, having a central feature store and having a little UI like this also makes it much easier for 
the different data scientists and the different teams to discover, well, what are the ML features that are available? Which ones can I use? Which one should I consider for my own use case? And one of my favorite case studies at Tecton is Atlassian, uh, which has been using us for quite a while now. And with Tecton, they were able to deploy new models literally just within a handful of days rather than months. And we helped them basically maintain perfect offline online parity to avoid this train serve skew that I talked about earlier. And as a result of all of this, the model accuracy went up by quite a bit too. So if any of this sounds interesting to you and you think a feature store is right for you, here are a couple places where you can go. If you're convinced you want to build your own, you want to uh, manage these data pipelines um, on your own, then here's a blog that you can read, how to build a feature store on our website that condenses down a bunch of the lessons we learned building the system here at Tecton and having built at Uber, at Uber beforehand. And a bunch of our people at, at Tecton here, they built feature stores also at Quora and Twitter and other places. So a lot of these lessons go into this blog. Um, further, um, if you want to manage your own, you can take a look at Feast, which is our open source feature store, which supports batch and streaming data sources um, and could be a nice way to kickstart your, um, your self-managed feature store efforts. And then finally, of course, I also want to call out that we have Tecton, which is a fully managed feature store um, that comes with enterprise capabilities, advanced transformations and SLAs and whatnot. And so if you don't want to build anything on your own, Tecton is probably a good place to start looking. Awesome. And with that, well, thank you very much. And um, if you want to chat more about this, feel free to reach out directly to Tecton, Kevin at Tecton.ai or um, ping me on our Tecton and Fees community Slack. Thank you.